I'm Park Howell, and welcome to the Business of Story. I thought it was just a stupid picture of a pig in the ocean. But after hearing that story, I had to have it. Now I wasn't just buying a picture. I was buying a story. Story literally made the picture worth more money to me. That's what businesses are about. People buy brands. People buy stories much more than anything else. I work with a lot of big enterprise companies, but let's just say I always tell folks, drop the PowerPoint, close your laptops, start with your story. If you want people to get engaged and you want people to act, you have to tell them an emotionally powerful story. That's with great characters, it's with uncertain outcomes, and it's with high stakes and drama. All business strategy is a story. Hey, welcome everyone to Business of Story. We've got an experiment for you today. Now, we were thinking, wouldn't it be interesting, and some of you have reached out and said, how exactly does the story cycle system work to build a brand, to build a brand story, whether that's a personal brand that you want to really dial in and clarify your personal brand story to grow your influence. And that could be influence if you're a solopreneur, um, if you are trying to become that uh, web guru and build your influence there, what is your story that really differentiates you and makes you stand out? Or maybe you work for a very large organization and you're feeling a little bit like a number in that organization. So it's really important more now than ever to dial in and clarify your personal brand story to grow your influence. On today's show, however, we're going to work both on the personal side and the business brand storytelling side. And we have a very, very brave guest with us today. His name is John Barney. He's coming to us from Orlando, Florida. And John answered the call in a previous show that I put out that said, hey, if you've got the guts to work your brand story live right here on Business of Story, send me uh, your request. Tell me what your story is about. And then I will select from those that come in. I picked two or three. John, was my first selection that came in and I sent him our DIY brand storytelling workbook so he got it he worked through the pages uh, really started dialing in his brand story sent it to me now this is the first time John and I have had a chance to talk about the input he's given me what he's put down the workbook and today we are going to bring this session to you although yes it's recorded but it is live for us because we literally have not spoken to each other before this my whole intent of this is to walk through John's brand story with him through the story cycle system. And while you are listening at home, take notes because what I'll be sharing and coaching John on about his story, you can use to define your story. Again, whether that's your personal brand story to grow your influence or your professional, that being your business brand story to grow your company, grow your organization and grow your people. So what do you say? Let's dive into this and let's get after it. John Barney from Orlando, Florida. Welcome to Business of Story. Thank you, Park. Good morning. Thanks for having me on the show. Well, and thanks for uh, volunteering. I mean, this is great. I know you have been listening for a while only because I see your tweets out there. And thank you for sharing the story uh, or sharing the show with your friends and family. How long have you been listening business to Business of Story? Mm, I think about a year. I heard uh, one of your interviews on Social Media Marketing Podcast. Mm -hmm. And then I came and um, started following your podcast and I've been hooked ever since. <laughs> oh, well, great. I, I appreciate that. And I want to confirm for those scoring at home that you and I have not compared notes in any way, shape or form about what you sent me on your brand story, correct? That is correct. I'm very busy and you're very busy. So this is uh, as live as it gets. Well, and we wanted to demonstrate this to folks that, you know, you can do this yourself. You can do it with a little help from me. Um, either way, today, you're going to be able to start clarifying and dialing in your brand story. So, Let's begin, and we're going to take them through the 10-step story cycle system. We won't have a chance to hit every single step because some of them take you a little bit deeper, and don't worry, I'll explain that when we get to it. But let's start with step number one, the backstory. John, give us your backstory about your brand, and let's, I guess, we need to set the stage that this brand is for a new venture that you have created, correct? Yes, sir. All right. So why don't you give us a quick backstory on where you've been, where are you now, and where do you want to go with this venture? Of course. So I've been in the hospitality industry for about 14 years. And I love hospitality because I had this really traumatic experience when I was about 10 with my family, went out to this dinner, and it was just completely awful. And I realized how much of an impact that people have on you, even if 
you really don't think they're that important in your life. You know, waiter, now what, barbers. What happened? What made it so awful? Well, you know, um, when you go out to dinner with your wife, how does that conversation usually go? Where do you want to go? I don't know. I picked last time. So we went out and the service was just terrible. And when we got, when we left and got home, my parents fought the entire night and we had to listen to it. And I was like, man, if I can just stop that from happening one time to someone, you know, it would be worth it. And they were fighting first because they were angst about where to go to dinner. They selected <laughs> yes. a place and it was a horrible experience. And that just yeah. aggravated the entire situation. So by the time they got home, instead of being relaxed and enjoying a family meal, they were at each other's throats. Oh, yeah. It started with my mom looking at my dad and saying, I told you we shouldn't have gone there. And then, you know, everything got released out from there. Yeah, so, that's interesting. And that, so that started when you were just 10 years old. And I want to make a quick point to the listeners here. See that story that John shared right there? It's just a small story. It's not like this big, huge, epic thing. And yet it had a profound impact on him. So this small little moment has triggered this passion inside of him to work in the hospitality industry. And it sounds like primarily with restaurants. So, okay, take us from there. Okay. So I've been working in hospitality and, um, you know, I always try to be the best at wherever I worked. And I found myself developing all the new people, mentoring them, kind of coaching them on the stuff they don't really teach you in training. And I really found a passion for it. I really saw the impact I could make on people and the, the customers through the people I was teaching. So I wanted to do that on my own. I applied for promotion after promotion in different positions and HR, and I was rejected every time. And can I be specific here? When you say hospitality industry, that covers a very big uh, industry. So are you talking lodging, food and beverage or what when you say, let's be specific Hotel, about hospitality? Hotels and restaurants, mainly in food and beverage. Okay. Food and beverage and hotel and restaurants. Great. Go ahead. Of course. And um, so I applied for all these things and I didn't have the college degree or I didn't have the right image or, you know, there's always it wasn't the right time. So I decided, you know what, I can do this on my own. There's enough technology out there that where I can go out and teach people everything I've learned about providing an amazing customer service or an amazing, amazing guest experience without having to get a promotion or to get a title. I can just do it on my own business. And that's where I'm at right now. So you started your company. What's the name of the company? The company is called Inspired Service. Inspired Service. So... Interesting. Quick little backstory. Love it. You had something that happened to you personally. You've never forgotten it since the age of 10. You got into the business. You're working through it. Uh, people weren't buying into your credentials, so it was hard to move forward. Yet you knew just literally by street smarts, I would say seat smarts, uh, <laughs> sitting in a restaurant that, man, it could be done way better. So you are now setting out to help train people to really make just incredible experiences at restaurants. Do I have that straight? Yes, sir. All right. So what we want to do in the backstory of this story cycle system is we want to boil this down to your number one position in the marketplace. What do you do better than anybody else? And when I say that, I mean, physically, what is it? What is the service that you deliver that nobody else can deliver like you deliver that gives you that panache, that edge, that differentiator that we all have to have because we live in this land of abundance and there are a abundant people doing what you're doing, John. There's abundant people doing what I'm doing. So we have to get crystal clear and focus on our message here in the first step. What do you do better than anybody else? And we go through this four little step exercise. It's real easy. So first and foremost, John, what industry are you working in? I would say professional services. Okay. And I want to stop you right there because I don't think you are. I think, you know, you do offer a professional service, but let's get, let's get focused. You've already said it several times. You work in the hospitality industry. You don't, okay. you're not working in insurance sales, right? You're not working in car sales. You are working specifically in hospitality, correct? Yes, sir. So let's say hospitality industry. Number one, this is at 50,000 foot level. Now, as I mentioned earlier, you mentioned hospitality, and I said, but what? Because hospitality covers a lot of things. So what category in, ho in hospitality do you work in? Food and beverage. Okay, definitely food and beverage. And when you say food and beverage, for those of us that maybe, you know, me included, aren't completely uh, aware of the entire hospitality industry, when you say food and beverage, does that mean in restaurant service? Or because food and beverage could be anything. It could be supplying oh, yes. food and beverage. It could be in a restaurant. It could be whatever. 
specifically in a restaurant setting where people would, any setting where people would sit down to enjoy food or drinks. Okay. The awesome. end, the end result of all the work behind the scenes. That leads us to this third step here. Um, so we've got the industry identified as hos- hospitality industry, categories, food and beverage. What is your specialty? So what so my, do you do? What is your specialty? My specialty is teaching. Okay, but let's take that a little bit deeper. See, because okay. right now we're in a category of food and beverage, and we don't know, are you a supplier of food and beverage? Are you a manufacturer of washing machine equipment for food and beverage? Or now let's get really focused on what in the category of food and beverage you do. So what is your um, your specialty in food and beverage? Customer service or food service. In Okay, food service, but let's take that a little bit deeper. So um, customer service, restaurant customer service? Yes. Training? Both, yes. Okay, so let's just so say training, the specialty food for... training, beverage professionals. All right, perfect. Specialty. Training, and it's customer service training, is it not? Yes, sir. So let's say that. Customer, because okay. because you could also be saying training the financials, training the operations, training whatever. So gotcha. let's get super specific. Customer service training in restaurants. All right. And by the way, for those of you listening out there, you don't have to be perfect. You don't have to word it perfect at this point. We're just simply trying to get it dialed in because now we're going to come to John's position statement or what is his number one specialty. So we know he works in the hospitality industry. His category is food and beverage. His specialty is customer service training for restaurants. Now... There's, there's a lot of people that still do that, but do you see how we are getting much more focused on what your story is? So mm-hmm. now we want you to rise above that, uh, the position statement, your number one specialty. John, what is it that you do in your company? And again, it is called Inspired Service. Yes, sir. What does Inspired Service do better than anybody else? Oof. I mean, now, how, is, how is your training different? I, there are How a lot of companies different? that, yeah. Okay. My, I focus on two things. I guess I'd have to boil it down to one, but I teach what you really need to do from experience and how to build a connection. And I teach it how, I teach you also how it makes your life better. I don't teach you, I teach you basically life skills that improve, that you can use at work. So you are using this customer service training to also teach life skills in the same process. So that's pretty interesting. Yes. Uh, I, I learned this from my mentor. He told me, he's like, you don't train people to be good at their job because when their their day's over, they start worrying about their life. So if you can make their life better at work, everything changes for them. And that, that really stuck with me. Interesting. So how would you articulate that? Inspired service um, builds life skills through customer service training for restaurant employees? Yeah, that sounds a little long, but I think that's it probably... Does. <laughs> All we're trying to do is get you focused because that's kind of a nice little surprise in there. I wouldn't think about life skills coming out of this. Um, but what you're saying is you're using the vehicle of restaurant training to help mm-hmm. teach people life skills. Yes. Yeah. So inspired service. So let's just, we're just going to capture the thought right now. Um, I'm just thinking here. So, and, and your audience, who buys this from you? We're going to get to audience in the next next page, but I just want to think, are restaurant owners primarily buying this service from you? Mostly it's the end user. So it would be like the server or the bartender. Oh, okay. So it could be one off. So they're buying this stuff. So you're teaching them how to become better at the food service world and in the process better at the life skills world. Mm-hmm. I show them how they can use customer service, not just at work, but how to... Um, you know, how to treat people better outside of work, to develop relationships, how to uh, manage their time. Like all the skills you learn waiting tables can easily transfer to anything you do in life. Okay. So what I like to do here for those of you, again, scoring at home, do this for yourself. Say your name. In this case, Inspired Service is the number one resource. And I'm just going to write down here to develop your food service, uh, customer service. We got food service, customer service to grow a more rewarding life. 
Now, that may be still a little bit long, but I just want to capture something. All I'm really trying to do here is capture very quickly what you do different than anybody else. You focus, you, you help them become better at what they do in the restaurant, and ultimately plays over to what they do for a better life. Spire yes, is the number painful. one resource to develop your food service customer to grow a more rewarding life. Okay. So let's just hold that. Does that ring true to you? Now, if you were sitting at a convention of customer service trainers around food service, could you tell that as quickly as possible and get you to start standing out in that crowd? I would say if I could boil it down to an elevator pitch, I would say I teach you life skills or I teach you skills at work. I teach you customer service, how to use customer service to make your life better. Great. That's great. I'm going to write that down. How to use customer service to make your life better. I love it. Okay. We're going to just hold that for right now, but you can now see where we are getting more of a fine point on John's story. Let's move on to the next page. So the next chapter is who's your hero. And all I want you to do here is identify who are your top three audiences. And then of those top three audiences, um, who's the number one audience? Because that's what we're going to focus on in this uh, session. So who are your top three audiences? My top three audiences would be uh, servers or waiters, bartenders, and then restaurant owners themselves would probably be like the third audience. Okay. So are servers and waiters your number one audience? Yes, sir. Excellent. Let's focus on that. Um, when you, by the way, are doing this for yourself, once you get into this, um, we ask the questions, what do they want? And then you can also use the same story cycle system to write a customer persona about who they are and what kind of journey, what kind of story are they living at this point where you can intersect that story with your product or service and help empower them, much like John is doing to teach them customer service, leveling them up into greater life skills. Um, that's what you want to do is really understand their story. So let's talk about the server for a second. We're not going to worry about bar tender and restaurant for this show. We only have okay. so much time. So what is the core thing the server or waiter wants? They want to learn how to make more money while they're working, be less stressed out while they're working, be more efficient and have a, a fulfillment or purpose. Like a lot of people get into it just kind of as a job through school and then they end up doing it for a long time. Mm hmm. So we want to, um, you know, help them in all three phases of their life while they're there trying to figure out what they want and then show them that they have it within them to pursue their passion, whatever that may be, traveling or being a doctor or being a businessman or whatever it is. I love it. So you identify the server and you've got three core things they want. They want to make more money. They want to be less stressed and they just want more fulfillment in their career choice. So mm -hmm. that's, that's great. That's where it takes us into step three of the story cycle system, and that's what, what's at stake. Now, when you do this, what I first want you to do is kind of sit down and think of what's at stake for you, the brand, in your short, medium, and long-term goals of you know, what, do you, what do you want to achieve and by when, because that gives you the guideposts or the mile markers you need to know how effectively you are telling your story and your story is connecting with other folks. But then what you do is you jump over and ask, what's at stake for my audiences? What is it that they want? Now, John has already kind of mentioned that, but John, can you quantify one of those things? So say I want to make more money. By taking your training, mm -hmm. can you tell them within a short amount of time, how long is it going to take for them to start seeing their tips increasing or I don't know, their hours, however they're going to be making more money? I would say within two weeks to 30 days, you should see if you're making average 15% tips, you can go to 18. If you're doing 18, you can go from to 20 to 22%. That's awesome. And do you guarantee it? So if they're taking your training and they don't see that, do they get their money back on your training? Yes. Awesome. All right. So what would be a short-term goal for the uh, becoming less stress? I mean, how can you quantify that? Mm, that's that's kind of tough. Because it's, it's more about being efficient. So there's this thing in restaurants called full hands in and full hands out. And you never go into the kitchen or into an area without something in your hands to take back or to bring out. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to... I Honestly, I don't have a way to quantify it at the moment. Well, there might be just that right there. When you start talking about that full hands in, full hands out, it could be that a lot of your market doesn't know that, have not been properly trained that way. So that would be something that you could be talking to them. It becomes an environmental trigger, we call it. And that mm -hmm. being when you're literally physically on the job and you're doing something 
pay attention to that full hands in, full hands out with a smile. And this is what the training is starting to ingrain in you. You want to be able to, you know, anchor it in the workplace. So it might be something as simple as that. Okay, okay, now let's look at kind of that longer term of what is it that that server waiter, we know that they want more fulfillment. What does that look like to them? Well, that would at first it would start with uh, making the changes in their life that kind of eliminating bad habits. Uh, restaurant workers are notorious for, um, you know, after work, you go have a few beers to unwind and, you know, how a few beers turns park, that turns into 12 or 15. And, um, you know, you spend half the money you make that night at the bar. So you wake up and you have this hangover and you don't have as much money and you're not feeling good and you go to work like that. And that cycle mm -hmm. continues, you know, for the week or the month. So it's kind of eliminating bad habits, getting uh, helping them get clear about what they want to do and then using the free time that they have from waiting tables. You know, you have all morning or all night to start moving in that direction. So something pops to mind is through Inspired Service, you're teaching them exemplary customer service to help serve themselves, essentially. When it ultimately is all said and done, you're teaching them how to serve others at, and be at the absolute tops of their games. And in doing so, they ultimately serve themselves through this life fulfillment thing. Yes. So there's, there, there could be something there. I would you know write that line down and working with you, or I share that with you, that, that, that idea of you know, you're ultimately getting trained to help others but in the long run, it is to serve yourself into a better life. And that then opens up that door for the life skills training that you're talking about with the habit formation and that kind of thing. So interesting. Good, 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 good. All right. Let's keep moving on. So we started with your backstory, started when you know, you're age 10, you had this experience. It obviously had a huge impact on you. You grew up kind of in, it sounds like, in the food service business. You have experience. There are better ways to handle this customer service. You thought, you know, why couldn't I start training it? Um, and thus has led to your you know, new program of inspired service. We know your audiences are servers and waiters, bartenders, and business owners, which I think is interesting because when I first heard about what you're doing, I was just picturing, oh, does the restaurant owner just hire John and he comes in and does it? But what you're really talking about is the absolute end user pays some sort of fee and then mm -hmm. you train them directly. And, and how does that work? Are you training them online or offline or, or how does that, what does that look like? The training? Well, right now, yeah, we would be doing on a Facebook Live. We're still kind of figuring out the best way to do it. But uh, Facebook Live or like sending videos or if they live close, just kind of meeting up with them for coffee and kind of doing a little mentoring right now as we're still uh, uh, brand new, we have time to be more personal. Mm -hmm. And I ask that because it leads us into step four of the story cycle. So we went from what the stakes, you identified who, you, who your audiences are, what's at stake for them. Now there's got to be disruption in the marketplace. Something has to happen or you are in response to a disruption in the marketplace because this is where it starts leading into your unique value proposition. What makes you more interesting, timely, relevant, urgent to your audiences than anybody else? You are absolutely filling a need. So uh, what is that? What is the disruption you see that either you're causing or you're responding to that makes Inspired Service the go-to resource? In hospitality or restaurant specifically, a lot of the training systems are very outdated. They give you three or four days, they hand you this stack of black and white papers and you read through it and just kind of repeat. And then when you get on the floor, you're kind of figuring everything out. I don't know if you've ever had a new waiter before, but they're very unsure of themselves, they're very nervous. Because um, most of the things you actually learn how to do your job, you don't learn in training. So we want to move all those things that you need to be ready into the training process. And two, most servers and waiters are very um, cynical or skeptical of people in suits. So if you have someone speaking their language from their experiences, they're a lot more receptive to any message that you would deliver to them. Uh, so it's, it's mono a mono peer to peer. I've been there. I've done it. I know how to do it. Let me show you the insides of what restaurant training is really about. It sounds like, and again, mm -hmm. I want to get you to be able to offer this exemplary customer experience to ultimately serve yourself because it's gonna help you in your overall life skills. Oh, of course, the, I work at a nice hotel at the moment and we use very nice language. Like, the, you know, you say, instead of saying, you're welcome, you say my pleasure. 
And the first time I came home and my wife said, oh, honey, could you take out the trash? And I said, of course, it would be my pleasure. She thought I was an alien had abducted me and I was not her husband. <laughs> I love it. I'm just making some notes right here. That's a, that's a wonderful example. Do you have another one where it crosses over from what you learn in the restaurant world to how it, it impacts your personal life? Oh, uh, yes. For example, when uh, you're waiting at a table, you're always trying to anticipate uh, needs or allergies or uh, you're trying to customize the service to each person. You serve a business table or a table of businessmen differently than you would a family with children. And when you apply that anticipation to the needs of, let's say, your wife or your children or your mother or your father, they uh, imagine the feeling that they get when you're always the most thoughtful person to them, that you're always thinking ahead for them. You pick up that little candy bar on the way home. Uh, you make the bed for them without them asking you or just little tiny things like that that you don't really think mean anything, but go a long, long way to improving your relationships. That's beautiful. I, I love that. Now, uh, my brush with the hospitality industry was at the Schnitzelbach restaurant when I was in high school. It was run by the McKisson family, authentic, authentic German restaurant in Kenmore, Washington. And me, my younger brother, uh, myself, my younger brother, we wore authentic lederhosen. We were out there. We were nice. bus boys. <laughs> we ran around. We had the hats. We had the lederhosen go on. <laughs> we would do a floor show. We were taught the authentic slap dance and the, we would come running running out with our friend Brad Hansen and Dan Dolan was there. I remember we would have a, a <laughs> log over our shoulder and we would throw that thing right down the middle of the dance floor. And they, or Bob McKisson, the owner of the place, would play uh, the guitar and his his daughter Sue would play the uh, accordion and they would oh, knock wonderful. out these old songs and we would do this wood chopping song and ch chips would go flying. We'd actually aim for people's soup to see if we could get a wood chip in their soup. And we did the <laughs> slap dance and we did all this stuff. I mean, it was it was a blast. It was hysterical. The only training I got in that job was kind of like you said, hands full, in and out, and let me teach you the slap dance, let me teach you the wood chopping dance and all that. It was it was terrific fun. Then I went to school, went to Wazoo, graduated, came out. At the time in 1984, Seattle was going through a bit of a recession, so there were just like no jobs to be had, mm -hmm. especially in the advertising world. A friend of mine... Kay Flagio was one of the assistant managers at a really terrific uh, seafood restaurant up there called Anthony's Homeport. So I went into Anthony's kind of on one, you know, on bended knee because I needed to make some money. I couldn't get a job. I felt horrible. I had these two degrees and I couldn't land anything. So I wanted to get a server job. But mm -hmm. I'd never been a waiter before. And because I knew her and I did have the uh, busboy work, she did make me a server. But there was such precious little training. And um, I, man, oh, man, I just fumbled through that job for three <laughs> months. It was, it was rugged. They were so nice they put up with me. I mean, I made all kinds of mistakes. But had I had the training that you're talking about, something, of course, we didn't have the interwebs back then, mm -hmm. um, to have the kind of training you're talking about would have made all the difference for me. So I love this call to adventure that you've got. And that is, look, at there's an old-fashioned way of, of teaching you exemplary customer experience, and that's either not at all or with these old manuals that nobody gives a crap about, or we can bring in the, the suits and the execs. Um, versus what you're doing, it sounds like, is now let me tell you real world examples of how this works. And by the way, let me show you how it makes a better life outside of the restaurant or where you're working. So I, do I have that right? Is this kind of how your story's starting to come together? Yeah, yeah, that sounds, you're hitting it right on the head. All right. So we've got, you know, step four figured out. Let's go to step five. Step five is what I call, uh, what, what do I call that, John? Step five is obstacles and antagonists. It's called villains, fog, and crevices. Villains, fog, and crevices. So what are the villains? What is the competition that you're up against to make uh, inspired uh, service really work? So the, my main competition are larger consulting firms uh, that, you know, kind of, if you think about it, they do. They say they're good at everything. Mm -hmm. You know, we can come in and show you how to, um, you know, fix the menu and the ambiance and we'll train everybody and all this stuff. So people will just go and hire them because they just don't want to do anything. Um, internal HR departments, they're very protective of their, you know, training and systems and uh, these programs that they come up with. I would say, uh, you know, my own personal fears and, and doubts and, uh, you know, that little inner voice that, you know, you, you pep yourself up and he's, oh, man, are you sure about that? That would probably be uh, the three main villains. 
Well, John, and I'm glad you mentioned that because I want to underscore that to our listeners too. When we talk about villains competition, it is first, you know, look at that external competition. Who's there that you have to overcome, you know, to, to get through? Who's going to try to take your market share? Because that's always where we think first. But then it's so important, as you have done there, is what is your internal competition. And that's that voice that says, maybe you're not smart enough, fast enough. You've got that fearful voice going. Or there could be internal competition of time, money, resources, that kind of thing that you got to get very clear on. So you know, within the story of developing your brand, what you have to overcome. The more you can truly finger and identify those competitive forces, the better for you, because actually there is great opportunity in competition. And I say that because every story has to have tension to it. Otherwise, you don't have a story. Every market offering has to be in response to tension. And we identified that in our first part, or in chapter four, when we talked about the call to adventure, that inciting incident. What are you overcoming? But then this is like highlighting or amplifying that tension because the more tension, the better the story. So you need, you've got now, you have to overcome the big boys, the guys have been doing it forever. Well, there's a great little story in there. You know, the anti story may be, oh, John, you're new to this. What do you know? Well, you know, let me tell you, starting age 10, what I know and how now we're delivering it in people's lives. So you have a great opportunity to tell a better story off of that anti-story. And you find the anti-stories within this chapter of understanding who the villains, who what the fog is. So for our listeners, again, the fog are the blind spots. What are your blind spots that you don't know that you don't know yet? And what <laughs> are unknown your- unknown unknowns. Exactly. Um, and what are your audience's blind spots relative to your offering? Okay. Uh, so I'll start with mine. Um, one is how many people will invest in their own training? You know, usually you go to a job and they're supposed to take care of everything for you. Um, you know, will a lot of people invest in it? Will owners, you know, take um, from their point of view, will they invest in a position that has notoriously high turnover? And uh, what will be the reaction to training that is more specific to the individual instead of, you know, about only about the company that we always do what's best for the company instead of trying to, you know, let's do what's best for the individual. And then that's what's best for the company. And then as far as the servers go, it's kind of fear of the unknown. Uh, will this work for me? Uh, this motivational, you know, they're, like I said, they're very skeptical. This motivation, inspirational stuff, you know, they might um, see it as, you know, a certain kind of cult and they don't want to be associated with that. So mm -hmm. those are the kind of things I'm, I'm dealing with at the moment. Okay. And it's really important to think about this now, too, as you are so close to it that in doing this process, I'm hoping that you discovered this for yourself, is that when you have to write it down and you truly have to articulate it to yourself so that you can explain it to an outsider, that it makes you embrace these obstacles and antagonists that much more. And that's really important so that you're not shrugging them off. I, I don't know if you experience that at this point, but that's one of the goals of this step is to get very crystal clear on what you're up against. And that also leads us then to the third one, and that's the uh, crevasses. What are the gaps between operationally what you say and what you're delivering? Or what are the gaps that you are trying to help your audiences overcome? They show up every day, but they have this big gap in performance that you are going to help bridge. So this is kind of that two-sided coin. First, what are the operational and story gaps that you experience in your own life with your own brand? And secondly, how do you help your customers close the gaps that they're up against? you know, in okay. the day-to-day. -day. It's starting to start thinking about your features and functions, the benefits that you offer. Okay. Um, so I would say that the main one is, is there enough, um, do I have the technology available to scale it? If it starts picking up quickly, will I have enough back into the house and networking and all that stuff to grow it without, um, you know, failure? For me, obviously, customer service is my life. And I want to make sure I'm delivering everything that I say 100% of the time without any any hiccups or issues like, you know, when your food comes out late or the drink was not refilled, you know, I can't imagine doing that to someone else. Um, if you're in the make, customer service realm, you better deliver a good customer service, I'd imagine. Of course, I can't. Yeah, I can't have any mistakes. Yep. Um, easy to, is the content easy to understand? You know, I, I consider myself a well-read person and sometimes, you know, I, I, I see these things as very easy, but I'm not looking at it always from someone else's point of view. Mm -hmm. So I want to make sure that I'm breaking down these very complex concepts into something very easy to understand. Makes sense. And then and what then, about for them? And then what for are, them, um, mm -hmm. 
it's going to be probably, you know, six to maybe eight weeks of, of constant training. Um, you know, they're, they're in a very high stress, fast paced environment. As you remember from your days of waiting tables, um, how are they going to remember all of this? You know, you're trying to remember the menu and the guest names and all these things. How are you going to remember one, remember these when you need to, and how are you going to implement it? Mm -hmm. And then as far as the long term, the fulfillment part of it is, um, how are they going to overcome their self, uh, sabotaging behaviors? You know, if they haven't done it already, what makes them think that I could come in and, you know, help them see things differently or make positive changes in their life? Great. So these are all the things that you have to be uber aware of as you are putting your brand story together and sharing that story with them, because these are the gaps that you want to close in their minds. It helps them overcome their blind spots, helps them overcome their own competition in their mind of saying, I can't afford this. I don't have time for this. What does he know? So by really understanding your villains, fog and crevices, it it helps you understand what story you have to tell them at what time in their purchasing decision, in their adoption you know, decision to get them on board. So great. Now we essentially are halfway through the story cycle system. And what I want you to do real quick, since we're talking about the food service world, I want you to picture a wishbone. All right. You got a wishbone in your hands. When we are putting, asking and working with people to put together their brand stories, you're actually are kind of putting two stories together at the same time, just like a wishbone. You got a left side, you got a right side, and they're going to start coming together at chapter six. Now, let me explain that a little bit more. So when we all first start out, we're thinking about our brand. And you start with the back stories we, we said in step one, you know, where you've been, where are you now, where are you going, and understanding what your number one position is in the marketplace. So that's the back story for your brand. As you identify who your audiences are in step two, you want to start thinking, well, what's their backstory? How are they coming to me? Are they coming to me as professionals that have been doing this for a long time? They want to get better. Are they new to the industry and they don't realize really all the opportunity that's available to them out there? Um, or are they just looking to try to get better across the board? So you think about their backstory. And then, you know, we identify who the hero is, um, what's at stake. You remember, I asked John to think of this in two ways. So on the left-hand side of that wishbone is John's story for inspired service. What's at stake for him? Short, medium, and long-term goals that he's going to be able to measure this storytelling against to see how effective he is in telling this story. And then on the right-hand side of that wishbone, you've got what's at stake for your audiences. What is it that they want to get out of this training with him? That's hugely important because as Zig Ziglar, the famous motivational speaker says, and I'll have to paraphrase because I don't have it down exactly right, but help people get what they want in life and they will go out of their way to make sure that you get what you want. But you first got to help them. So this is where you think of what's at stake for your organization, but more importantly, what's at stake for your customers to adopt you. We move into the uh, fourth step of this, and this is uh, the call to adventure, that inciting incident, understanding what your unique value proposition is. So emotionally, what do you deliver to them so that they can get what they want out of life. Now, and then, by the way, when you get into step five, we're still in the wishbone. It's still somewhat divided, but we're getting closer to where the union comes in step six. And step five, again, is considering the villains, fog, and crevasses that you are up against as a brand as you're writing your story. Then, of course, jump over to the right side of the wishbone and think about the villains, fog, and crevasses that your customers, your audiences are up against to adopting you to getting involved. So the more you can understand the journey they're on, the better you can connect your story to them. And that happens then in step six, enter the mentor. And this is where you really get to focus on yourself as the brand. So we have your customers, and your audiences as the hero of this journey. They are, you know, we identified them in step two, who's your hero. It's not the brand, it's a customer. You, the brand, John, in your case, play a much more valuable role as the mentor or guide. So in this step, step six, enter the mentor is when the brand arrives. And we want to start humanizing and bringing personality to this brand. So what I asked you to do, John, is identify nine adjectives, adverbs, descriptors, whatever, that you feel are the DNA of your company inspired service. What are those nine words? So starting with number one, I would say rebellious. 
humor, empathy, authenticity, boldness, inspiring, simple, motivation, and purposeful. Love it. Now, the reason why I do this is in all the hundreds and hundreds of times that we've been through this, when I ask people to arrive at three words that best described who they were, we always ended up with nine. It just, it just seems like that's what happens. And I think the reason why is you can think about this from a Genesis stage. You know, think about the three words that really talk about where you came from. Um, the, the product stage, what are the three words that describe your product or service offering? And then your customer service phase, you know, what are three words? Words that describe it. That's another way to break it down. But you say rebellious. Give us a story, John, of of how you back up rebellious as being a brand descriptor. Give me give us an example of your rebellion. So instead of doing like the um, the normal training, you know, you sit in an office for three or four days, and you know, have some guy just read stuff off to you. We actively engage them. We make them participate and think on their feet and give them real world scenarios. We also make it fun in using things that they already are kind of familiar with to relate to what they're going to be doing. And do you have an example? Have you already done one of these trainings? Yes, I have. So um, what we do is we'll do a mock service, for example. And most people will do it, but they just kind of go through and like, oh, you know, tell me what's on the menu. Tell me this. And, and they don't challenge them. You know, what we're doing is we're giving them like, let's say the stages, a uh, couple who just come in. They're very hungry and they're arguing in front of you. Now serve them. So it kind of makes it, you know, people get to act and play along and, and uh, you know, really use their personalities. And, you know, if people are laughing, they're learning more, they're bonding. And by the time they go out on the floor, they're, they're ready and they remember these cues uh, because of the humor and the laughter instead of just um, – have you ever watched The Simpsons? Oh, yeah. Yep. Okay, I picture what we do is kind of more like Bart and what normal training is like is kind of like Revel and Lovejoy. <laughs> okay. Very Give dry it, and boring and just very monotone. Have you had anybody show up rolling their eyes and say, okay, here we go again, and then you surprise them and how your training goes? Not yet. We're still uh, kind of developing and trying things out, but no, we're open to um, many things. Like one of, the, um, one of the things I like to do is when I'm talking in a group, I give everyone a phone ball. Mm -hmm. So when I'm talking and if anything doesn't make sense or they're not um, – you know, following along, they get to throw the phone ball at me. Mm -hmm. So it makes it very engaging. I know they're wanting to pay attention because obviously everyone's going to want to throw a ball at the teacher. Um, but it's a fun way to get people to, to pay attention and not zone out and, you know, look outside the window. Yeah. So you're just bringing a lot of fun to this. So here's what I want you to do. And this reminds me of being back at the Schnitzelbank, actually. And for all of you listeners out here, I want you to start boiling it down to little stories and moments in your life that back up your brand story because they're hugely important. So, John, what you did is you just gave us kind of an overview of what you do. And what I was digging for is to give us an actual moment, something that, that, that actually happened that you can talk about. You could even name the people, or if you don't want to name the people, give them a fictitious name, but take us to something that actually happened. Don't just talk on the very high level. This is a hard thing to do because we're, we default and we're taught just to talk in features and functions, which you just did. Here's an example of what I'm talking about. Okay. So back at the Schnitzelbank restaurant, I am, I think, in the ninth grade at this point. It's a Sunday evening, family run, beautiful little restaurant. The restaurant's about three quarters of the way full. It's not huge. It's small. It's got the parquet floor in the middle. It's got the little riser for the band, the oompa band I was talking about earlier, where Bob and Sue McKissing get up there and play and we do our show. It's roughly about 4.30 in the afternoon because we, we don't do a show on Sunday, by the way. So it's a lot quieter around there. I come out to the bus station right in the middle of the room. It's just in between the bar and the dining room. And, you know, it's got uh, you've got that little tray there. It's got the f f four wells in it. And in each well, you've got a soup spoon, you know, a bunch of soup spoons. You got uh, knives, you got forks. You know, there's probably 100 pieces of silverware sitting in there. So I come and I'm lugging this thing out. And it's heavy for me. I was a skinny little ninth grader. Got my leader <laughs> hose on, got my hat on. I mean, I'm just all decked out. I put the thing in the bus station. And I turn to scoot back to the kitchen to be as efficient as I can. So I move fairly quickly. But unbeknownst to me, my big buttons in the front. Now, I want you to picture Mickey Mouse and his suspenders and the buttons that come down to hold his shorts up. Well, essentially, those were the buttons I had. They had hooked 
underneath the lip of that serving tray where I had just put all the uh, utensils in. I turn around and it goes flying onto the dance floor, crashing like like a thousand cymbals. You know, all these <laughs> old folks in there just like, oh, ah, oh. I mean, it was like out of control. Bob McKissing comes racing out of the bar. He was the bartender, the old guy that ran the place. And he looked at me and he looked at the mess I just made. And, you know, the fact I scared the hell out of everybody. And I thought I was in so much trouble. And Bob just started laughing. He started slapping his knee. He started playing, you know, this whole thing that, oh, I, you know, he planned that. It was a part of a good old German tradition of making noise and whatever. Um, <laughs> he took me to the back of the house. He was laughing. He thanked me for it. He said, boy, that was a stodgy crowd. You really opened it up. Um, and I tell you what, that guy endeared me to him at that point, because what he did is he demonstrated something that you have here in one of your lists, empathy. So it's a story of empathy that I looked at him. He had total empathy for what I went through, what I, had just happened to me. But do you see how that story drags you in? It, it, it pulls you in. It's actually a story about something that happens. And so what I want you to do and all my listeners out there, what I want you to do, if you're going through this and you've written down your nine descriptors, I want you to now go and attach a story to each one of those descriptors, an actual event that happens that, in your case, John, demonstrates your rebellion, demonstrates the humor in your approach, demonstrates the empathy, and so forth. I don't want you to talk about it and make you know high-level references to it. I want you to tell me about an actual human moment that demonstrates that this is a part of who you are and part of the character of the brand that you're building. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah, much clearer. Yeah. And by the way... This is called story spotting, and you do this, and you uh, you get through nine, you're going to end up with nine more and nine more and nine more. And before you know it, you're going to end up with 100 true, authentic stories, well told, that you can use and will use to support your overall meta brand story. Got me? That's why that's so important. Okay, perfect. All right. So let's keep boiling this down. We're still in Enter the Mentor. We've identified your nine brand attributes. Now, what's your brand promise. And what I mean by this is emotionally, what do people get from interacting with your brand? One word, emotionally, what do they pull away every time, whether they're an employee of yours, whether they're a customer of yours, whether there's someone who gets impacted because the service is great? What would you say that word is? I was struggling between acknowledgement and recognition. Okay, that's what they get, but that's not emotion. That's something that just happens to them. What do they, what is an emotion they get that they are leveled up? They are better because of what you do. This is the one where I, where I kind of got stuck on it. So I, yeah. I really didn't have anything else. How do you make them feel? What is it? I mean, is it confidence? Is it empowerment? Is it happiness? Is it. You know, I and you don't have to arrive at it right here, but this is something that acknowledgement starts taking you in that direction. But what what do they really do? You know, this is what we talk about. It's not what you yeah. make, but what you make happen in their life. What you make is this customer service training, but what do you actually make happen in your customer's life and your the people that are buying your service? Hmm. Yeah, let me get to work on it. Yeah, be thinking about that. Then next up, and it's still on this whole thing of it's not what you make, but what you make happen even more so with this is what is the gift? When they're all said and done, they get this training, but what does that training enable them to do? It's the gift that goes beyond. So for instance, with mine is I teach people storytelling or I work with their brand story, but you know what the gift is, is, is they get this reignited superpower, you get a chance now to use something that's actually is probably lying dormant in you. And the more intentional you can be about using story, the more you will connect and you will engage and be with your audiences. And so like for me, my brand purpose, my promise is, um, is to enchant, simply to get you to a story that absolutely enchants people to buy into it and then experience it and they continue to be enchanted by it. So my brand promises that enchantment. My gift is to reignite that storyteller in you. What is your gift through your customer service? 
I think we kind of touched on it earlier. I would just say killer customer service skills. Yeah, but that's what you make. What do you make happen? What do you make happen in these people's lives? By making them, by connecting customer service and life skills, what are you, what are you actually doing for them? Hmm. Park here. I'm, I'm, I'm at a loss for words on this one. I'm just that's okay. It. It's something, but it's perfect because, you know, you're not alone when I go through this with folks. This is typically where we are in the process. They will come back with something that's very operationally driven because that's mm. what we think of as brand builders and, and entrepreneurs. We think of operations. I'm trying to get you out of operations into a motion. So gotcha. you can so get back to me. A gift, so it would be like hope. Or maybe um, clarity. Could be. Those, those could be. Could be a brand. Could be that promise and that gift. So emotionally, what do they get? And then functionally, what do they get? That, that customer service is one thing. They experience customer service. That is your vehicle to get them to like this next level. They get leveled up somehow. So I want I you to be really thinking about the, that. The word mm-hmm. for it. Like if I could picture these people, it would be like a – you know, these like silent guardians, these heroes, these people who are, you know, these unsung heroes who do so much for you behind the scenes to make sure you have a good night and, you know, don't. Hmm. Yeah. But that's what I want you to think of in both of these cases. It's not what you make. What you make is customer service training, but what do you make happen? Make happen. That's what I want okay. you to be thinking about. What do you make happen in their lives? Now, like okay. Red Bull, here's a good example of it. What do they make? They make an energy drink. But what do they make happen? They give you wings. Yes. That's, see, they, they get this nice little hook there. Gotcha. So, yeah, it, you know, their they're, uh, amino acids and their caffeine and sugar, if they got it in there, helps pump you up, you know, it energizes <laughs> you. But they don't say it energizes, it says gives you wings because that's just much more metaphorical. It speaks to our lizard brain that loves story. It's the only thing that our brains love, you know, story. So, all right, let's keep moving through the uh, Enter the Mentor. I want you to be thinking about your brand's promise, emotionally, what do they get, and gift. How do you level them up? How do you give them wings? How would you describe that? Okay. Finally, you went through and you looked at uh, the 10 Jungian archetypes, and these are important because I wanted you to find a personality that you would ascribe to your brand. You want to make the inanimate object of your brand animate. You want to give it a personality, and this personality is important because it informs everything you do through your website communications, through how you train, through your in-person training, through how you entice them in. So of the 12, and by the way, uh, Carl Jung was a famous Swiss uh, psychiatrist, psychologist along the same you know time as Freud, and he identified these 12 archetypes. And I've got on SlideShare, I'll put a link in here where you can go and see the 12 archetypes for yourself. But as you reviewed those 12 personality archetypes, which one did you arrive at for your uh, for your brand? The the primary one I felt when I'm kind of looking at all these uh, dynamics was, was the rebel or the outlaw. And why is that? I think it's because there's speaking of uh, kind of like a Robin Hood. Like there's a man of the people speaking up for these people that need this good training. They want, people want to do a good job, but the way that it's being fed to them is not the right way to teach. Mm-hmm. And, and so you were coming in and you were, it, it sounds like too, with how you approach teaching that you do it in a fun, outlandish way to keep people's attention and show them something's different. Oh, of course. If you don't have people's attention, you lose it about after eight seconds. Mm-hmm. So if you don't have them engaged and really bought into what you're doing, think about all that money you're spending. You're paying them to sit there and stare at the wall. Yeah. So I love it. So now that you've got that rebel outlaw type of personality after the show, go back and think about the promise that that rebel and outlaw provides you and that gift. What does that rebel give you? You know, the, uh, Luke in, in Star Wars, certainly his mentor, Obi-Wan, he got the lightsaber. He showed him how to use it. But what did he really get? He taught him how to use the force. The gift in yeah, all of that was the force. So what is your gift, the force that you are providing your your customers as that rebel or outlaw character? Gotcha. Knowledge? <laughs> Could be knowledge, but can you make it more emotional? That's kind of boring. If you're a rebel and outlaw, don't bore me because that doesn't go hand in hand with the character, the, the personality that you're creating for your brand. 
So you got to be consistent across this. But let's keep going because we're coming to the top of the show and we still have a couple more stages to go. We're not going to spend a lot of time in the next one uh, because it really dials, drills down into your customer journey. And that's called uh, Chapter 7, The Road of Trials. And I look at three primary things, brand awareness, brand adoption, brand appreciation. And I grant it, you know, customer journey specialists, which I'm not, uh, can go into 10 and 12 different journey points to get them through. But the only ones I care about when you're really pulling together your story are that I'd have never heard of you before, and now I have. That's brand awareness. So what kind of story do you tell them, and where are they on their journey that they first uh, first come across you. Brand adoption. Okay, I'm in. I'm going to hire you once. I want you to come in. I'm going to take a little, t- you know, little morsel. This is the appetizer, if you will, to get into them. Um, so you can level them up into the full course meal and keep them coming back for more. And then you've got brand appreciation. That's when, man, I love this place. We're coming back. You deliver another great experience the second time around, the third time around. And that ultimately ultimately leads to brand of uh, 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 brand. What am I trying to say? Uh, loyalty uh, promotion. Yeah. Loyalty. Um, there's another word. I Enlightenment came to me, but that's not it. Evangelism. That's what I'm looking for. So gotcha. um, we won't cover that here, but I know you did in your book. And if you're listening at home, that's what I want you to do is take all three of your audiences that you've identified and go through. When does each one of those audiences first come across your brand, brand awareness? So, and what, where are they in their journey and how do you connect in that journey with your story? What stories do you tell them? Brand adoption. All right. They're in, they bought. Um, and then brand appreciation. How do you keep them coming back for more? It leads us to step six or step eight. I'm sorry, is victory is at hand. And this is really important because you've got this long story going on. So how do you design victory points so that you're there to celebrate with your customers? So, John, what's your first victory point that you can say, all right, we've together have gotten this far and you celebrate that with your audience? Um, well, what I put down was um, making them laugh on like I, I'm really good on Instagram. So I post like uh, things that they can relate to and then make them laugh and comment and share with one of their friends. So this is before they even buy anything. That's great. So that's really the brand awareness side. So you're mm-hmm. giving them something, you're triggering an emotion. I imagine you're doing that with that rebel or outlaw um, attitude. And then yeah, they can- usually, usually it's things that, uh, you know, weird quirks that the customers have that can kind of upset your night or, you know, the things that the managers do or say that really don't make any sense. Right. So, you know, we like to poke fun at them. <laughs> but you're connecting with them on their terms because they're saying, hey, this guy gets me. Yes, he's, he, he felt the pain of, uh, you know, a table, let's say, for example, a table of 12 people at the end of the service want to split the check 12 ways. Yeah. It takes you 15 minutes to split that check and then the rest of the tables are being neglected. So that's something that uh, people can relate to for sure. Great. Okay. So we're going to keep moving on. Uh Chapter number nine, because I want you to do that for all of your audiences, by the way. What are the little victories in, for all your audiences at those different levels? Chapter nine, hugely important. In fact, you might even start at chapter nine and then come back to it again. That's called the moral of your story. So this is the brand purpose. This is the North Star. What do you stand for uh, besides making money that your entire story revolves around? So what is your brand purpose? So this is the worksheet. Yep. The, Read so your brand purpose the old ways of training and the perceptions of, you know, the service industry from bartenders and servers. Okay. That is very operational, very functional, very boring. Okay. Um, and it doesn't, it's not rebellious. It's not interesting. No offense. But no, I no, want no. something that people Tell me the could, truth. some people that you know could really live into. You know, that's my job is to help you find those most powerful stories that you can live into and prosper from. So what about this? And I always like to have you put your name brand down. Your brand exists to do what? How do you help people? And just from what you've told me after reviewing your work and what we've talked about, to me, it's like inspired service exists to help people. Live a tastier life. Nice. <laughs> Is that a brand purpose you can get behind? Yeah, it's perfect. So think about it, you know. 
I'm here to help you live a taste of your life. And that means first, take care of your customers with the most amazing customer service. Give them a custom, exemplary customer experience so that you can grow your life skills and lead a taste of your life. So you're not only helping your customers have a tastier experience, not just in the form of the flavor of the food, but their mm-hmm. overall experience. And then leading on to that next thing of building career skills or life skills, a taste of your life for yourself. So does that make sense? Inspired service helps people, exists to help people live a tastier life. That's beautiful. Thank you. I mean, it's it's easy for me from the outside looking in because you've done all the hard work. You've done all the heavy lifting. All I'm doing is <laughs> I'm being Carl Jung and Freud all at the same time, and I'm unpacking the psychology behind your, your brand. And that's ultimately what this comes down to is what is the psychology of your brand and how can you have fun with it? Final chapter in this, we don't really have time for it now, um, but you're not really into it yet. And that is chapter 10, To Be Continued. How do you build brand rituals into your service? So you get them in, they buy your service, they go through it, they have a lot of experience. How do you keep them coming back for more? And how do you get them sending their friends and family to you so that you get to train them? Um, Big question. That really starts coming down to your overall communications plan and how you put this story together. But it's an important question because you got to have that call to action in every story you tell. What do you want them to do next? What happens next? From awareness, from adoption, from appreciation, from evangelism, how do you have them around 10 years from now? And when you tell and share a story with them, what is the next thing you want them to do? So that's where chapter 10 comes in. It really starts then leading into your overall communications plan. The point in that chapter 10 to be continued building brand rituals is you now want to hand off your story to them. They become your storyteller for inspired service. You are just the story creator. You're the story maker. By demonstrating to them through your products and services of how you have leveled up their life, their journey, you've been their mentor guide to help them get what they want. They go out of their way to help you get what you want. Understand how that works explicitly, and then make sure you have a call to adventure. You have a call to action in every single story you either tell, share, or help them experience. Does that make sense? Yeah, perfect. So now one last thing. Um, What you might do from that brand purpose is you could see inspired service, live a taste of your life. Could be your your tagline. So It's funny that you said that. I literally just wrote that down. Live a taste of your life. So it's like, I can train you to be like the top server anywhere ever. You're going to make more money. You are going to be have less stress, be stress-free. You are going to have repeat customers asking for your table. Um, and it's just going to be way more fulfilling because now you're not just schlepping food around, but you are actually a really important person in those people's diners' lives to help make their life a little bit better. And oh, by the way, when you go home, you make everybody's life around you better because of what you learn in that dining room you can share in the living room of life. Of course. Yeah, you, you have a certain amount of time and I, and I kind of developed it on my own. I was like, well, I have kids and a wife. So the only way I can really uh, practice these things I'm reading in all these books and hearing on all these shows is at work with all these people. So let's see what works. Okay, that was that worked. That didn't work. And, you know, it's kind of your own training ground. Why not get paid by someone else to to learn? Yeah. You know, and that's even another little nice line right there that I might throw out is, um, you know, what do you do? I teach you uh, what you learn in the dining room. You get to use in the living room of life. That's kind of interesting. I don't know. You know. Something fun you might throw out there. So, hey, John, uh, any any final thoughts for us? I'm, we're over the top of the hour. I'm glad we spent this amount of time. It went fairly quickly, but you can see with using the story cycle system that it doesn't take that long. It takes some effort. You put in the great effort to get us to where we are today. But within an hour, we were pretty much able to style in your story. Park, I just wanted to uh, say thank you for all the work that you do and helping me out with this and uh, really helping me find um, where the, uh, you know, the pressure points are, the things where I wasn't so clear and kind of really, really making me reimagine those and go think of them to make the story more powerful. 
Oh, well, you're so welcome. And thank you for being my first volunteer to come on Business of Story and uh, work your story with us. And I hope that you out there in Listenerville got something out of this. We're able to take a pen and pad out and start crafting your own story. So, John, thank you for being with us today. Hey, it's my pleasure, Park. Someone has to be the first monkey shot into space. So I'm, I'm glad that was me. <laughs> and definitely keep us posted. Let me know how it's going when you get your final brand story dialed in. Shoot it back to me, and maybe we can get you back on the show, and we can talk about how that's all come together for you and and the growth you're seeing, how it's connecting with your audiences out there. Oh, that'd be wonderful. Thank you, Park. And thank you all for listening to this edition of Business of Story. Now, look, if you would like to do what John has done, go to businessofstory.com, download your DIY workbook. You now have a whole hour tutorial of what, how to use it to fill it out. Plus, there's links in there. Every chapter has a short video of me uh, sharing with you what to do in that particular chapter. So download your DIY notebook at businessofstory.com. And of course, while you're there, uh, listen to other podcasts. I've got uh, uh, other episodes. I've got a ton of worksheets there that you can use. My job is to help you live into your most powerful stories. And it all begins over there at businessofstory.com. Thank you for listening. If you liked what you heard today and you want to give a shout out to John, shoot over to iTunes and give me a little note. Give me a ranking. It helps you share my show with your world, which I'm greatly appreciative of. Anyways, thanks for being here. And please join me next week when we will have another story artist on Business of Story. And until then, have a wonderful life. <laughs>